come on in. I, <laughs> I feel bad about this picture. I know you're already cold. <clears throat> but I had this plan before, and I promise we did not want to illustrate how, how bad things were and, and someone just went and turned the gas off. I promise. ONG really is out there. So, uh, you know, that's not how that went down. Last Sunday, and uh, the 54 of us that enjoyed this, let's try that again. There we go. We looked at uh, the choices in 1 John, light or darkness, inside or outside, true or false, love or hate. Um, John is pretty black and white. And uh, what John was dealing with in 1 John and what we deal with, honestly, is, well, we're human beings and we keep trying to do the in-between thing. Well, I like light most of the time. <laughs> I, I, I like being inside, but I like going outside some. I like truth, but uh, it's okay if someone wants to lie to me. I've never met anybody that actually said that. But uh, we all tend to slip into that deceit mode and that half-truth mode so easily. And love and hate is, of course, a big issue in our world today. And uh, John says, you know... If, if you're going to be a follower of Christ, if you're going to, if you're going to say you love God, there's some, there's some things that just need to be true of you, and, and we've got to get to the cream of what that is. I gave this illustration last week about walking in the light. You know, come on in, just leave your muddy boots outside. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship. We get to come in. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses those muddy boots. He cleanses our sin. In other words, we don't bring our sin inside. We don't bring our sin into the light. We, you know, God says, that's not how it works. There can't be light if you try to bring darkness into it. And, and light is pretty hardy. You know, you really can't overcome light with darkness. <laughs> a little candle a couple of miles away can be seen in the blackest night. But we sometimes try to bring our muddy shoes uh, inside. And sometimes what we do is we say, well... You know, they're really not that bad because I'm so cute. And God says, your sin is not cute. Sorry. So this isn't really where we want to be. And this is from chapter 1. And I realize so, uh, many of us were not able to be here last week. And so I wanted to kind of bring at least that much to your attention. This week I want us to look at the theme, shut the door. Come on in. Shut the door. Did you, didn't you feel that way this morning? Who, who left the doors open? How come it's so cold in here? Well, actually, if we'd have opened them, it'd probably been warmer because it's actually warmer outside right now. Shut the door. You know, the way to, to be on the inside and enjoy the warmth is not only not to bring the mud in, but the, don't let anything come in from the outside. And that's going to take some real effort. Here we are in John, uh, 1 John, I'm sorry, chapter 2, and I'm going to start in verse 8 here. I'm writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. That's that fellowship. It's true in him, it's true in you. We're, we're getting together on this thing. The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light. There is no cause for stumbling in him. In other words, if we're going to have light... That's where we need to be. Abide there. Live there. Come in. Shut the door. That's, that's the idea. We don't do this half time this, half time that thing. We don't do it partly or halfway. We say, you know, light is what I want. Love is what I want. And I want to work harder to make that constant. If we are in the light and yet hate our brother, if we say that, it, no, it's not true. Just because we say one thing, and if we don't do it, it's a, it's a lie for us. And John's pretty, pretty good at hammering on that, as he did in the first chapter. This is the example from the second chapter, verse 9. Verse 11 goes on to say, The one who hates his brother is in the darkness, and he walks in the darkness. And he does not know where he's going, because the darkness has blinded his eyes. You know, we think about light blinding our eyes, don't we? <laughs> we say, oh, that's kind of bright. That I can't see because it's so bright. John says, no, really, that's, that's not how it works. It's the darkness that makes us unable to see, and that's where the stumbling comes. Who wants to walk around in the dark? I mean, that's not a good thing. You don't know where you're going if you're in the dark. So you need to be in the light, come inside, shut the door. 
And, and, the, and the basic test for that, in this case, is loving our brother and not using hate. Now what John does now for several verses, he talks to little children, young men, and fathers. Your sins has been forgiven you, he says. You know him who has been from the beginning. You have overcome the evil one. He's, uh, he's kind of summarizing, I think, here. And so I look at these messages on the right side of the screen and say, yeah, walking in the light, forgiveness, knowing him. That's that intimate fellowship that we should have. And that, and that making a difference in our lives as we overcome the evil one. He comes back again. He says, you know, you know the Father. And you know him who has been from the beginning. And that would be also Jesus. You are strong and the word of God abides in you. And then he sums it up. You've overcome the evil one. How does this overcoming happen? I mean, John's, you know, he's kind of coming along and he says, you need to walk in the light. God is light. You need to deal with sin. You need to love your brother. And, and really, I'm talking to people who understand this because you've been there. You've done well. You know God. You know Jesus. You've done some overcoming of the evil one. The catch is, he's, he's standing at the door knocking, trying to get you to come back outside. Can he convince you to leave the light? If you're going to overcome, you're going to have to address this one thing. Verse 15 to 16. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, it's from the world. It's, it's just very clear when John says, okay, inside or outside, truth or false. You know, how are you going to do this? You're going to love the world, you're going to love God. This is, this is a, a major determiner of how life is going to go this year as we look ahead and we say, I, I really want a stronger spiritual life. Well, this is going to be a test. You know how I know it's a test? Because it goes all the way back to the beginning. And it goes to Jesus himself. These temptations that are mentioned in John 2, verses 15 and 16, the serpent used in the garden on Eve. And Satan used in the wilderness on Jesus. Here they are. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life. Eve saw that the tree was good for food, pleasant to the eyes, and desirable to make one wise. Hmm. Satan says, Jesus, turn these stones into bread. Look at all you could have. Look at all these kingdoms you could have. And why don't you just cast yourself off the pinnacle of the temple? You know, they're going to, God's going to take care of you. These are classic stories of temptation. Do you think Satan has changed his mind about how to get to us? He succeeded with Eve. He did not with Jesus. But he's using the same stuff on us. He's coming at us exactly the same way. He's telling you, take care of your body. Give your body what it wants. Whatever that is. However much that is. Do some more. And we're saying, yeah, that really tasted good. Let me have some more. Do you need more? Do you just want more? That's how we're in this shape we're in. Or, well, yeah, that's about what we could call it. This shape we're in. That's where we have problems with sexual sin in our culture. So prevalent and rampant. People say, hmm, I think that would feel good. I'll just go do it. It's classic temptation, folks. Satan says, this will be good. This will be good. What do you say? How about the lust of the eyes? That, that desire for more, that desire for something out there. Grass is greener syndrome. Man, are they hammering it on you now. You already got plans for your big screen TV replacement? Culture's uh, getting you all geared up for the Super Bowl. Best sales of the year. And you need one. Okay. It, you know, if, if you need one, you need one. I'm not, I'm not knocking that. I'm just saying, when you don't need this stuff, the culture's still coming at you. Satan's still saying, how about a bigger one? How about a better one? How about that one over there? You, you, you don't want to just keep what you got. Go for something else. And then there's that pride of life, that search for significance, as one author called it. Eve looked at that tree and she said, 
That's true. I'd be wiser if I ate this fruit. I'd be like God, knowing good and evil. That's what the serpent said. So she's thinking, man, I'd be really good when that happens. Well, except you'd be really dead. Because God says you die when you eat that fruit. And he came back at Jesus the same way. You want to feel really good? Feel cared for. Just throw yourself off the pinnacle of the temple and feel those angels bearing you up. You're stone. Stone's not going to find your foot. Not going to happen. You'll feel so good, Jesus, being cared for. He's coming at you, folks. He's coming at you right now. While we're talking to you this morning, he's, he's, he's talking in your other ear. While, while Carol's up here telling us about the spending plan, and I didn't, I'm sorry, it was a little grim. But you know, reality's reality. We've got to face it. Satan's over here saying, don't worry about that. I got some other stuff I need you to do. I got other stuff you can buy. There's other stuff you need. Don't worry about them. They'll take care of themselves. He's coming after us. Because he knows good things await. He knows we have plans. He doesn't want us to carry them out. Love God, love your brother. That's basically the summary. Or you can love the world and the things in the world and put things ahead of God. You look at John's message and he's been talking about you want to have fellowship with God? You need to confess your sin. You need to admit there is sin, and then you need to say what, which ones you're committing. Bring those out in the light where they can be forgiven. That's how you overcome evil. And you're going to want to abide in His Word. You're going to want to hear what His will is and, and stay clear on what that is, because Satan's always counterfeiting it in one ear. The world's always trying to give you a different standard. Go back and refer to the notes. Check the instructions again. Really? Is that significance? A bigger car, a bigger television set, a bigger house? Is that really significance? Because in my book, it's just more to clean and more to take care of and higher insurance premiums. I mean, think about it. We say, oh, I'm going to go get me a nice new car, and I can afford it because the payment's only this much. Well, yeah, well, then there's the insurance. And they really like those new cars to be insured. And you're going to have to do it. Tell me, I already know. I lost my Mustang at that same intersection those two boys got T-boned at last year. Not, not a good deal. Not any fun. But if we're going to abide where we need to be, we're going to have to take these messages and put them into the reality of the Spirit because it's just a different reality the way God sees it. Now, I'm going to read through some of these other passages. Uh, I'm going to... Because I started to stop here and I thought, yes, but these things still address it. And they really deal with the reality where we live and the, the solution to the challenges against our faith. It is the last hour, John says. John's an old man at this point. It's the last hour, folks. Just as you heard the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. And then a couple of verses later, they went out from us. They were not really of us, for if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. What John is saying is, you know, there are some people, as you look around you, that used to be here and they're not. They went out from us. Satan's picking us off. He's getting some of us. And if you thought about it for a minute, you'd realize, this time last year, there was someone sitting in this room that was going to have a really good year, and they're gone, folks. He got them. And that's kind of grim. But that's what happens when you get toward the last hour. He says, because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but the one that denies Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one that denies the Father and the Son. John's problem in his day were some folks that came along and said, you know, I love this God talk, but don't talk to me about Jesus. You ever heard that? It's all around us. We'll be glad for you to come pray for the city council, Matt Crane, but you can't pray in the name of Jesus. Sorry. See, everybody says, well, let's take the Father but not the Son in our culture. John says that's a lie. Because, you know, Father and Son, they're close. And what you do to one, you do to the other. Try it. And that works with God. And so when people try to deceive us and say, you know, just take part of your religion. The other half's not really that necessary. 
You're being lied to. The world is passing away in its lust. The one who does the will of, the, of God lives forever. You have an anointing from the Holy One. You all know. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. One who confesses the Son has the Father also. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and the Father. He's, he's hitting us with a, a, a number of things here that really will help us if we'll listen. This is the promise. This is what's at stake. Eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. As for you, the anointing which you received is from him who abides in you. So abide in him that when he appears we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. Let me go back through that a little bit. It is the last hour, John says. Beware the lie. The lie is you don't need Jesus. God will do. The world is temporary. It's passing away. All this stuff you think you need, it's going to be out of date soon. Not everyone that comes to God stays with God. They went out from us. And the last thing I want to do is appear at the throne of God and have to hang my head in shame. Because I tried to half do this thing. Or I believed some lie and I got deceived and I got picked off. John says these are the critical things that we really need to pay attention to. What's the solution according to just these last few verses? You want to do God's will. That's going to require that you know God's will. But we all understand that there are things we know that we're not doing. And, and that, that doing part is kind of important. We've got to get to those things that we know are important. And we've got to find a way to make it happen. Now, he says we have some tools for that. And one is an anointing. I believe he's talking about the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Holy One, he says. The Holy Spirit that we receive at baptism. We get forgiveness of sins and we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That is, in us is the Spirit of God. And if we will listen to that voice instead of the tempter, we know what to do. So trust the anointing. And when your conscience says, you know, you probably really don't want to go there, don't go there. <laughs> listen to God's voice. Abide in the Father and the Son to make it complete. The solution here is not just try not to sin. See, that's not going to work. <laughs> Willpower just doesn't last very long, does it? Think chocolate pie. You know, willpower just doesn't cut it. If you're going to beat chocolate pie, you better start thinking of something else. Better for you to eat. See, you've you, you got to conjure that up. And so when we abide in the Father and the Son... Satan comes along and says, yeah, but it's nice, pretty snow out here. You say, yeah, but it's cold out there. It's dark out there, and I get scared in the dark. I ain't coming out there. I'm staying in here with the Father. I'm staying in here with His Son. And then he says, be confident. You know, you try and you fail. Okay, you get forgiveness. Get up. I looked at someone's blog this morning. It was called The Eighth Rising. I thought, hmm, what's that? It's a proverb, I think, chapter 24. The righteous man falls seven times, but he gets up. So the eighth time, well, he's still getting up. See, and that's how it has to be sometimes. Because we try, and we try the willpower approach, and every now and then we listen to Satan anyway, and we go outside to see if it's still cold, and it is. And God has to forgive us. But He does, and He does it every time. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus the righteous. So be confident. This is an eternal life that we've already started as Christians. We've been born again not ever to die. Not spiritually. You know, I was with Jack Friday and even on the morphine, he, he got me again. <laughs> we walked into his room and uh, we're kind of in ICU step down. We kind of walked right through and and yet, there's lots of extra monitors and things. And He's on morphine and walked over to his bed. Bobby had already filled Mark and I in on what was going on. And I kind of already knew, I thought. We walked over to the bed and Jack said, Well, 
I went down to the bank and there wasn't anybody there to get me. I thought, bank, bank, where have you gone to a bank? <laughs> Bobby says, the Jordan. That's his way of saying, I nearly died yesterday. I went down to the bank, but there wasn't anybody there to get me, so I'm here. What do you say? Hey, this is an eternal gig. 91 years, and he's saying, hey, this side's good, the other side's better. Belva's over there. <laughs> Don't talk to me. Don't talk to me about sad. It makes us cry. We don't like to think of it that way. But it's confidence, and it's eternal, and it'll last you for 90 years. God blesses you to live that long. It may be the last hour. We don't have to give in. So come in. But shut the door on the world. You don't want that. Let's pray again. Father, it's our privilege to enjoy this fellowship with you. It is our privilege to receive your love and then receive your forgiveness and your mercy and your grace. It's our privilege to receive these gifts over and over as we need them. And it is our privilege, Father, to share them with others and to be loving toward our, our neighbor as you have been to us, to our world that needs you and your ways. Father, so much deceit around us. There's so many other ways, it seems. And we pray that you'll just focus our hearts on what is real, what is true. Draw us to you and keep us from the evil one. May we enjoy the eternal life that you've designed for us to have. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We like to offer this invitation so that you can come to the front if you so desire. But I'm, I'm asking you this morning to respond. In your mind, in your heart, whether you sit at your seat, stand up while singing, or come down to the front, I want you to choose something that's got to go. I want you to choose something that needs to start. I want you to be intentional about this year. You know, people say, don't ask me what I'm going to give. I don't know. Hey, I bet you know what your paycheck is. I bet you weren't going to go to work until they told you how much it was. And even that retirement, I bet you know. I bet you know how many pennies that is. That's all it's talking about. Let's be intentional. Let's step out there and say, this is what I'd like to do. Who knows what the year holds? I get that. But if we don't step out there and make some changes for the good and against the bad, we're loving the world, plain and simple. So make the response, and if you need to make it publicly, we'd love to pray with you as we stand and sing.